On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, and when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How many of you are familiar, aware that today is Pentecost? One, okay. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a special holy day, if you will, a holiday. But let's be honest, um, in our tradition, we're not real big on holidays. You know, we never have been. Uh, we place, as the Bible directs us, a lot of emphasis, of course, on the Lord's Supper, which in a way is, is a holiday, a holy day. It's a very special observance. It's something we do in, uh, to uh, remember, to memorialize, which is really what holidays uh, are about. You know, when I, when I talk about being uh, it, by tradition, you know, we don't really focus on holidays. I mean, all of us, I think, uh, have our family traditions and cultural things that we do. But as a church, we really don't much pass communion, as I've already said. Um, and I, I, I always find it awkward. It happens every year around the, the holidays, Christmas time. And, and uh, people that know that, you know, I, that I'm a part of this congregation are always asking me about our Christmas Eve service. If you ever get those conversations Oh, well, we don't have a Christmas Eve. What, you don't believe in Christmas? What? You know, no, 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 it's not that. And, you know, what about your Easter service? Well, you know, we don't have an Easter service. You know, I, I talk about Easter a lot on Easter Sunday. And, you know, and people just think that that's weird. And then, of course, you know, sometimes I turn that around and talking about the communion. But what got me thinking about this, and I did this last year, too, a year ago today, we talked about Pentecost. It just kind of caught my attention. But uh, Caleb, uh, my son, over in Omaha. Oh, and let me, uh, let me share this bit of news with you. We haven't said a lot about this. But last Sunday when we were gone, the reason we were gone is we were welcoming a new member to uh, the Hamister family. Caleb got married. So hello to a Mrs. Hamister, uh, Alicia Hamister. Hopefully you'll get to meet her this, this summer. We're excited and uh, a delightful young woman. Um, you know, we never thought uh, Caleb would find such a beautiful woman, but he did. So we're excited for that. That's a joke. Okay. So Caleb knows that. 
And I'm sure Alicia is enjoying that too. I know they're joining us this morning over the, over the internet, so welcome. Um, but anyways, Caleb had shared with me an experience that a group of, of uh, his brothers and sisters in the church there at Omaha last month got together and celebrated Purim. How many of you are familiar with that? Or the Feast of Lots, as you might have heard of that. It's talked about in the book of Esther, and it's one of those Jewish festivals. And so the idea was, is, hey, let's get together and celebrate that. Now, the neat thing about a lot of these Jewish festivals, at like the, you know, Pentecost was at one point, uh, we can be fairly confident about the dates because we, we have so much of that history through our Old Testament and, and the traditions of of uh, many Jews continuing to celebrate uh, those holidays. And Purim is one of those. And so the idea was, as a, a group of these Christians over in Omaha, of our brothers and sisters, got together to celebrate Purim. And so they researched it and figured out uh, some food things that were connected to it and, uh, and did the study of the book of Esther. And I thought, what a great fellowship idea to to do that and, and to think about that. And you've got to keep this in mind too. That's our history, right? The Old Testament, that's our history. And we should know it. We should respect it. And, uh, and when you think about Passover, we probably know the most about. One of the great traditions with that, and I think a lot of the Jewish festivals, is it was a time to remember, to commemorate, but maybe more importantly, to teach to teach who? The kids, the next generation, to, to hold tight those values and lessons that were there to be learned about God. And Purim was a great festival to be reminded about how God takes care of his people. Do we need lessons like that today? Do we need to be reminded and encouraged in our world today that God takes care of us? that God's still in control and in charge regardless of what's going on in the world. So uh, I just thought that was a, a great example. But when I think about Pentecost too, I mean, come on. It's the birth of the church, right? It's the beginning of the church. Should that not be significant to us? And should that not be something that we are proclaiming to the world? Of course it is. Of course it is. But I think, too, what, one of the things uh, about uh, Pentecost is uh, it really is a celebration, I think, in a lot of ways, of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, I've, and I've confessed this before, and I'll confess it again. Um, I, I get kind of nervous talking about the Holy Spirit. Do you? You do. Lots of you do. Again, it's kind of one of those things about us. Um, you know, is it a fear that maybe we'll be seen as charismatic, you know, something like that. And we, we, you know, and that we don't want to go that far, but it's one of those things too. Maybe we don't know enough about it to be comfortable with it, which is amazing too. When you think about how many times, how many passages there are in our new Testament that talk about the Holy spirit. I mean, if we're spending any amount of time in our Bibles, uh, we read a lot about the Holy Spirit. But sometimes it just, let's just be honest, it just kind of feels like it's this thing over here, okay? And so today I just want to, in the spirit of Pentecost, I want us to, to look at some things about the Holy Spirit to hopefully uh, grow in our understanding. As I was referring to before about that Passover, that tradition of getting together the family and retelling those stories and talking about what they mean. What a great experience for us to, to revisit that story in Acts chapter 2 of the beginning of the church and to be reminded of the significance of that and the responsibility that we have to promote the church, to grow the church, to share the gospel in that, in that effort and how uh, our beginning should empower us uh, to really do that. So a couple of questions here too, you know, in thinking about this, can you describe how the Holy Spirit makes a difference in your life on a daily basis? I would imagine uh, many of you, maybe most of you uh, could. Um, but I, I just want you to think about that. Can you really answer that question? 
can you discuss that question? Could you teach somebody else how the Holy Spirit might make a difference in their life? And let's just be honest, too. Sometimes in, in having a conversation or looking in a question like this, we think of a passage and we just, you know, um, share it, repeat it. But does that mean we really understand it? Do, do we really understand how it applies to our life and, and makes a difference? You know me. I, I ask more questions than I answer, okay? And I, I, I'm purposeful about that. I really am. Because you need to figure it out for yourself. You really do. And, and this is a question I'd like to challenge us with. How does the Holy Spirit make a difference in your life? And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm around people and they, they'll make a comment like, well, the Holy Spirit, you know, directed me this way. And I'm like, whoa, oh, that's, whoa, how do you know that? And really, this is part of my struggle, I'm, I'm confessing here. Um, and, and it is a matter of faith. It absolutely, it absolutely is. And so what I need to do uh, and I hope you'll take along with me today is, is go on a journey through the New Testament, looking at some passages about the Holy Spirit, that I might grow my faith in the work of the Holy Spirit in my life so that I might become more comfortable to have those conversations about how the Holy Spirit can make a difference in your life and in the lives of our, our friends and neighbors. So we go right to Matthew 28 and 19. And one of the reasons that I want to point out this passage too is when you think about Pentecost, this is something that happened, that Jesus instituted, if you will, the command that he gave us very shortly before that uh, Pentecost that we refer to in, in, in uh, Acts chapter 2. And I think this was very specific. I think it was very planned. I think it was very orderly that Jesus would, would make this command quite clear to us just ahead of receiving the Holy Spirit in a very miraculous way in the beginning uh, of the church. And this is the Great Commission, of course. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And again, when you look at that, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, Father, got a pretty good understanding there, you know? creator of everything, the son, the one that um, paid the price for my sin, uh, and then the Holy Spirit. Okay, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Well, it's the gift that we get at this time of baptism. You know, nobody teaches better than the churches of Christ, Acts 2.38. Man, we got that. We got that. You know, the old joke in preacher school, you know, back when I was in Abilene Christian, is that, you know, give me an axe and two thirty-eights, and I can take on anybody, you know. Give you a moment to think about that. Um, but, you know, we, we know that forwards and backwards, don't we? And we should. I like to say it's going to be on the test, okay? And that test I'm talking about, and I'll reference that a couple of times today, is that judgment day. You know how it was when we were in school, especially college, I remember this. If the teacher wanted to get our attention about what they were sharing that day, they would just say, hey, this is going to be on the test. And all of a sudden you wake up and now you start taking notes, right? Because it's going to be on the test. Well, guys, this is going to be on the test. And I've been very critical about this over the last several weeks. You know, this, you know, can we truly explain that and defend the connection of baptism to salvation? Okay, it's going to be on the test going to be on the test. So we better be able to do that because it's about being obedient to this, this amazing command, the Great Commission. But again, look at the emphasis here. Just pay attention. It's not just God. It's not just Jesus, but it's the Holy Spirit too. When you look at that passage on the screen behind me, or up here if you're on the internet, does this show some importance of the Holy Spirit? Just nod like this. Okay. From John chapter 14 and verse 26, but the helper, stop right there, the helper. The Holy Spirit is described to us as a helper. Isn't it nice to have a helper? Isn't it nice not to have to do things on your own, to know that you've got some support 
to, to, to meet the challenges and obligations that we have in life, that we have as God's children, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I really like that. Bring to my remembrance. Boy, if I need help with anything, it's memory, right? Exactly. You know, uh, every, every Sunday I got to look up the church's address so I get to the right place. It's just terrible. It's terrible. Um, I don't know what's going to happen when I turn 70. I'll just have to call you or something. It's just Who knows if I'll ever get here. Now, this was a specific promise or a statement, too, to those first uh, uh, disciples, apostles. But I believe the teaching here extends to us, too. We can experience the help, if you will, of having the Holy Spirit to guide us, to direct us, to help us to remember, to, to equip us. You know, I, I think of that passage, and I can't think of the number off the top of my head. I want to say 1 Corinthians 10, 14. That's probably wrong, so correct me. But that idea of, you know, we will never experience anything that we can't handle. Okay, where is that text? Uh, anyways, I think part of that, or the reason that that's true, is because God provides us that helper. So whatever it is that we experience, whatever it is that we're challenged with, we have God through the Holy Spirit, if you will. And I'm not even sure if that's an accurate way to say that. Um, I, um, I, I think it is. I think it is. But the idea is we have that help. We have that support. From Matthew 12, 32, let's see what we can see here about the Spirit. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, there's a lot about this passage I can't explain. I'll just be honest with you. But what I do glean from this passage is this idea, the Holy Spirit's important. I mean, it, it, and I'm even I'm kind of afraid to say this. It, it, isn't the Holy Spirit being elevated over Jesus here? I mean, if you think about that, if we speak a word against the Son of Man, we will be forgiven. But do it against the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. Not now or ever. So again, look at how that elevates the importance of the Holy Spirit. And, and our response, if you will, or interaction with the Holy Spirit. You better be careful. You better be careful, all right? Another one to look at is Luke uh, 3 and verse 16. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, literally we see that happening uh, on that, that day of Pentecost as it was recorded for us in, in Acts chapter in Acts chapter 2, John says, you know, yeah, what I'm doing is important here, but I'm just preparing the way. Somebody more important, much more important is coming. And, and there will be no doubt. There will be no doubt about it. That's what I, I really appreciate about this as well, this day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church, is there was no doubt. The prophecies were clear. Statements like this for John were clear. He said, when it happens, you're going to know that it happens. And we, we certainly did. From Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, it says that, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Doesn't say to God. Doesn't say to Jesus. Doesn't say to the congregation. Doesn't say to me, an apostle. To the Holy Spirit. And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land, the sale of your land. Now, I think most of us are familiar with this story. And it's, a, it's a, a great story, too, in connection with the characteristics that we see of that first century church, everybody taking care of everybody else. And what that meant is those that had an abundance or extra or just, bottom line, willing to give up some of their stuff to help the congregation, to help the church, and they were just doing it all the time. And so uh, Ananias, his wife Sapphira, uh, the text later on says she had full knowledge of this, um, kind of got wrapped up 
in this idea of um, just wanting to be special, if you will. Wanting some awareness, if you will. Wanted to be elevated. Pride. We're talking about pride here. So they had some land, and they were willing to sell it. And honestly, they could have done whatever they wanted with that land. They could have done whatever they wanted with the money that they got for selling that land. What they did is uh, they sold it for this amount, came to the apostles with this amount, and said, here is all the money we got for selling our land. We are amazing servants, aren't we? Look at how generous we are. We're giving you all the money that we got for that land. Could we get our name up on the bullet in there as the top contributor? I mean, this is that pride thing working here, okay? And Peter said, why are you lying about this? But again, the point to the Holy Spirit. To the Holy Spirit. Again, look at 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 who the Holy Spirit is. The importance of the Holy Spirit here. And going back to a verse previously where it talked about, you know, when, when you sin against the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. Well, what happened here? Drop dead. Drop dead. That's not forgiveness, is it? And what happened later on? When his wife came in, and she was given the opportunity to make amends. She was given the opportunity to tell the truth. The question was asked of her, is this the amount of money that you got for the land? She said, yep, and dropped dead. Why? Lied to the Holy Spirit. Wow. Wow. From Acts 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did before you. You know, when I read this, I think, stiff-necked people. Am I on that list? Let me think about that. Stiff-necked people. Unreasonable. I mean, what 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 would be some characteristics of a of stiff neck people? Unreasonable, pride, unwilling to discuss things, uh, unopen to things, um, stiff necked, unyielding, unforgiving. I mean, are, anybody you want to be with? You want to spend a day with stiff necked people? Probably not. You know, think just think about that. Stiff-necked people. Are we ever that? Uncircumcised. The idea of holding on to things that maybe aren't holy. Holding on to things that aren't godly. Unwilling to give up. I mean, that's, that's the teaching here with this idea of circumcision. Giving up, letting go of things That we're not supposed to. I mean, literally, sin and, you know, a sinful lifestyle, sinful thinking. That opposite of a servant attitude kinds of things. Uncircumcised heart and ears, unwilling maybe to listen to the truth. I mean, just keep working with that. Stiff-necked. And because of that, then we run the risk of resisting the Holy Spirit, being open to the Holy Spirit. See, here's what I think is part of my problem. As I struggle with the Holy Spirit working in my life, do I hear the Holy Spirit? Do I speak the language of the Holy Spirit? See, here's the language of the Holy Spirit. So if I'm not spending enough time learning the language, I probably can't hear the Spirit talking to me, leading me, directing me. You know, uh, most of you are well aware I have a pretty severe hearing loss, and that's why I wear my hearing aids. Whoop, how'd that happen? And uh, so a rule in my house 
Kathy still struggles with this. If I don't answer you, you have to assume I didn't hear you. You have to. Because 100% of the time, that's usually the case. Now, we struggle with that a little bit. I mean, let's be honest. We talk to each other all the time, especially husbands and wives, and you all holler something at your spouse, and they don't answer you, but you just, you know, or at least you assume they, they heard you, okay? But you can't do that with me. Even with my hearing aids in, my hearing is still not what yours is. So <laughs> whenever I get in trouble for not doing something, I'm like, I'll say, well, you never told me. Oh, I did too, tell you. You can hear Kathy saying that. And, I'm, and my response is, is, did I answer you? And she'll go, ah! Because she knows. She knows. If I don't answer her, she can't assume that I heard her. So, so I, I think about that in the context of the Holy Spirit. You know, and let's be honest. I'll be honest. Sometimes I did hear her. Sometimes I did. Okay? And that's just my get-out-of-jail card, you know. <laughs> Um, and so I wonder that about the, the spirit. Am I hearing it and maybe just don't recognize it? Um, am I hearing it and just dismissing it? Or am I just not in tune at all and, and can't hear it? You know, have I put myself or allowed myself to be in a place because of sin in my life that, that has me out of tune with the Spirit? And therefore, I can't hear it. And that would be a good definition of that stiff-necked person, wouldn't it? And let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. We all have those moments, don't we? Don't we? I mean, if you're perfect, go ahead and raise your hand. From Acts 10, verse 45, it says, And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. You know, this Pentecost, described for us in Acts chapter 2, this beginning of the church, was a world-changing event. And several things happened there. You know, many prophecies had, had been fulfilled in this moment. Uh, the church began... And, but there was a big change here that was going to be hard, especially for Israel, to comprehend in many ways, to understand and to receive, and, and even more so to welcome. And it was the idea that they were no longer the only chosen ones. Now the church was open for everyone, for everyone. And so isn't it amazing that the, these events, this baptism by fire, this this miraculous outpouring of these gifts was clear evidence that this is it. The church has started. The Old Testament has been fulfilled. It has been set aside. And now we have the new world changing. But the Jew, God, I think God knew the Jews would need some help. His first chosen would need some help. And so what did he do? He prepared an event through Cornelius and Peter, to experience uh, much of the same thing that happened in that upper room, the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We don't see the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 10, but we see many miracles taking place. And, and, and Peter, you know, he, he basically, you know, as this story goes on here, makes the point, when I saw the evidence of the Holy Spirit, how could I deny baptizing them? Okay? And he, and he took that evidence to Jerusalem, and he shared it with the other apostles. And when they heard that, it's like, ah, so God now includes the Gentiles. And they praised God for it. So pay attention to that. The beginning of the church connected with the coming of the Holy Spirit. The teaching that the church would be for all connected to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And you as an individual becoming a child of God connected to the gift of the Holy Spirit. There is no doubt here. God makes it clear. 
God makes it clear that all of these beginnings are connected to receiving the Holy Spirit. Got some great news from Candy, Ohio. Uh, the other day. And for those of you who know me, you know Candy, Ohio was the first church that I've ever worked with up in Candy, Ohio, Minnesota. And I was sponsored and supported in that work by the Faith Village Church of Christ in Wichita Falls. They supported it, Kathy and I, uh, for eight years up there. And the first thing that we did, the first summer that we were there, uh, we had a door knocking campaign. And a group from Faith Village, um, Church of Christ there in Wichita Falls, Texas, sent up a, a group of workers, and they knocked the doors, and they set up several Bible studies, and of course, then we had to keep those going after they left, and one of those Bible studies that was set up was with the, the Halliday family, Deb Halliday, um, and uh, I've... Uh, after the group left, I was the one that got to uh, continue studying with Deb. And uh, as I did that, I, I can remember she was all, every time we'd get together as we're doing this, says, oh, my husband, Kevin, would just love this. He would just love this. So finally, I got smart and I said, well, why don't we invite Kevin to join us then? Duh. And so we had to change when we did it. And, and, and so as that progressed, it was kind of funny. Uh, I, I studied with both of them. And then after a while, Deb stopped joining us for the study, you know. She might be back in the kitchen doing something and kind of listening, but as it continued, it was just more and more about Kevin, and Kevin became a, a very dear friend. Uh, just just love Kevin and uh, miss, miss having the opportunity to, to be around him, so I'm always excited when I can. And I can remember, uh, it wasn't too long after we started studying with Kevin, I, I got to baptize him, and he put off his baptism for a while, and I finally asked him, I said, Kevin, come on, you know, because I'm talking to him as a buddy now. It's like, man, you got to do this. And he shared with me, he said, ah, I just so much want Debbie and I to get baptized at the same time. And when that became apparent that it wasn't going to happen, he, he was obedient to the command of baptism and became a child of God. Well, two weeks ago, Debbie got baptized, baptized by her boys. And, you know, it, that, that, so that journey, that seed was planted 35 years ago. So take heart when you're doing that, when you're sharing the gospel, when you're planting that seed, don't give up on it. Don't give up. And if anybody from Candy, Ohio is tuned in today, I can't wait to give my sister a hug. But uh, what, it, was, it just made me feel so good. But here's the thing. Now, Debbie was active with the church in a lot of ways. She was there a lot. If we were having a special function, she was there. The kids participated in everything, all our VBS, and grew up going to camp, and we hunted, we boated together, and we were just, it was just wonderful. But the bottom line is, Debbie was not a Christian until two weeks ago. Why do I say that with such affirmation? Because you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is quite clear that the only time we can get the Holy Spirit is when we're baptized. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter later goes on to explain that by this baptism we are saved. There is no doubt about that. It's on the test, by the way. It's on the test. Okay? It's on the test. And so I, I, you know, I shared with Miss Halliday for all those years that we were fellow believers. Now I share with her, we are fellow Christians. We are fellow Christians. So excited about that. From 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we read, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. And so I go back to that idea and my struggle with being a stiff-necked person. In those moments, am I an appropriate receptacle for the Holy Spirit? You know, I think that's part of what this passage is telling us, is we... Um, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. That's what grace is all about. But he does expect us to be humbled by sin, to feel miserable 
because of sin. To be driven not to live under the control of sin. And I think that's part of, the, of, of God's plan behind the presence of the Holy Spirit is to give us the strength that we need, the fortitude that we need to work through those challenging times that we all have. I know this just isn't my problem. I just know that. But at the same time, we have to realize at what point, at what point do we become too far in that journey of sin that we are no longer an appropriate receptacle of God's Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. You see, I think God knows our heart, and that's, I think that's the proof here. It's a matter of the heart. And God judges that better than we can judge our own heart. And while there is, is, is hope that we will make those right decisions, I think we can count on God's grace, and that means we can count on the presence of the Holy Spirit, but don't take it for granted, because you can lose it. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. So for us to live like it does is simply ignorant. From Ephesians 4.30 it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Again, that being that stiff-necked, unyielding kind of person you know, living such a life where we are no longer an appropriate receptacle of the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm an elementary school principal uh, during the week, and uh, probably the biggest reason, mostly little boys, but sometimes little girls, mostly little boys, the greatest reason they end up in my office is because they have grieved their teacher. They have grieved their teacher. So think about that. One, and so I address whatever I need to address with them. And before I walk them back to the room or to let them head back to their classroom, we always talk about, okay, how are you going to make sure you don't get back in my office? Because I'm first time, I'm good with that. Second time, it's a different experience with Mr. Hamster if he's had to see you twice in the day. It just is. The wrath of Rudy comes out. And um, so what? So I always ask him, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to make sure you don't get back here? And the best answer is I'm going to follow my teacher's directions. And if they can't figure that out on their own, I even have a little graphic thing that I share with them about how important it is to follow their teacher's directions and even how to do it. Got a Boys Town skill that we teach them. And uh, you know what? It's, isn't it the same thing when you think about God and you think about the Holy Spirit? Following directions. Think about that. Following directions. That's how we keep from grieving the Holy Spirit following directions from 1 Timothy. Oh, let me go back to this too. Sealed. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is really going to be uh, where we start wrapping up this idea here today. Sealed for the day of redemption. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This idea that, hey, this is important. The Holy Spirit is important. It, it's a guarantee. And we'll look at another passage from uh, Ephesians 6 about this. It's a, it's a guarantee. All right, Ephesians 1, excuse me. It's a guarantee. It's a deposit. It's a little bit of taste of what's coming. It's a little bit of taste of what's coming. From Romans chapter 8, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Getting back to that helper, remember that? The Spirit is a helper. And this is a great passage that talks about how that happens. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. 
And I'd like to suggest to you, too, that I just don't think this is something that we're aware of. I just don't think it is. And, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but I love this idea that this Holy Spirit is working above and beyond my own understanding to help me <coughs> to do what I may not even know I need to have done. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, intercedes for the saints according to God's will. I just love that idea that, that I might be messing up so much, but if my heart's in the right place, I've got the Spirit keeping me connected and doing whatever needs to be done to strengthen me, to maybe reconnect me, to empower me. Oh my gosh, isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting? Celebrating Pentecost is celebrating the Holy Spirit's work in our lives in our history, and maybe more important, in our future. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Pentecost, and I've already said this, life-changing event in the world. In our baptism, we touch this event, and it changes our world personally. God commands and equips us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, promised to us in Acts 2.38, to become a conduit of His blessings to the rest of the world. Okay? Here's what I've been pointing to. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. And I want to suggest to you, our study of Romans chapter 10, it isn't just this idea of, oh Lord, come into my heart. We know better than that. That idea of believing in him is acting on his commands. Believed in him, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And we know that that gift is promised to us at baptism, okay? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee, a down payment, if you will, of our inheritance, talking about heaven, of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. This is what our hope is based on. This is what our hope is based on. And we have this Spirit as a guarantee. That really resonated with me this week as I was studying for this lesson. So I, I just ask the question, what's a guarantee? What's a guarantee? Well, from the dictionary, a couple of definitions. It's a promise or an assurance, especially one in writing. In writing, okay? In writing. That something is of special specified quality, content, and benefit, or that it will perform satisfactory for a given length of time, a money-back guarantee. Well, we're not promised. Well, I know, maybe we do kind of have a money-back guarantee. Ah, not really. Maybe the second definition is a little better. An assurance that another's obligation will be fulfilled or something presented as such security. Okay. Heaven is guaranteed for us. But I want you to think about this too. How many of you have ever bought anything and got a guarantee? You all have. Raise your hand. You all have. <laughs> we went up to Blooming Prairie yesterday, spent some time with my dad and my brothers, and uh, on the way up there, there, I saw this auto sign. Lifetime warranty, you know? And we love that. You know, we wouldn't dare buy anything that's not guaranteed anymore, would we? You know, let's, let's think about this a moment. What makes a guarantee good? You know, I, I'll tell you this. I, I bought a steel roof for my house five years ago, and it has leaked ever since. Mm, yeah. So 
You think that, now I have a I have a signed card from the owner of the company, lifetime warranty. Okay? But I wasn't worried about it. First couple of years that we were going through this, every time I called after it rained, there was a crew there, sometimes the next day, but within a week. And this went on for three years. And there was more than one leak, and they got fixed. But there was one leak that has never been fixed, and nobody could figure it out. Well, about two years ago, all of a sudden the phone number that I had wouldn't get answered. You know? And, and when I finally did get through, a, a crew was promised and never showed up. And that happened multiple times. So I'm going to learn what an attorney general does this summer. So what makes a guarantee good? Well, first of all, it's the quality of the product, right? The quality of the product. Years ago, we bought a Kia. You remember when Kias first came out, the big thing, and they still do it. They, I think they were the first company to ever warranty their engines for how many miles? 100,000 miles. Well, guess what? Kathy's went out at 130. Warranty wasn't any good anymore. We had to buy that baby ourselves. But if it had been 999000 we would have got a free engine out of it. That didn't happen. Quality of the proc. And I, I'm not talking against Kia. It lasted as long as they said it would. So a little bit more. So we're all good there. But honestly, for a company that creates a quality product, guaranteeing it's no big deal. Because the products just work. But the other part of that is the quality of the person making the guarantee. I think the product that was put on the roof of my house over there in Independence is a great product. But there were some problems with installation. And there's problems with a gentleman now standing behind his word. But you know what? We don't have those issues with God's promise. And I want you to know that the product and the person behind the guarantee are 100% solid. So my question to you today as we wrap this lesson up is who's ready to guarantee your future with the best guarantee in the world? If you're ready to do that today, won't you come? Well, together we stand and sing this song of encouragement.